Hi, everyone. So, oh, it's working. So, uh, we'll be talking about uh, how to build a website that will eventually work on Mars. Uh, before we begin, uh, Bruce already, already did a great introduction, but uh, let me tell you something about me. So, I'm Slobodan Stojanovic, and uh, I'm working with Bolshoi Theater, <laughs> as you heard. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm CTO of Cloud Horizon. Uh, that's a small digital agency. Uh, oops. Yeah. Uh, small dig uh, digital agency. We are doing uh, different uh, applications for different startups. Uh, part of it is, is in Montreal, and other part is in Belgrade. And beside that, I'm organizing JavaScript uh, meetups in Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and there's a few different things on uh, GitHub. I'm working a lot now with uh, chatbots and things like that. And uh, before we continue, I would like to know something about you. So I have a few questions. First one is, uh, did anyone of you ever visited Mars? <laughs> no? OK. Is there Elon Musk in the audience? No? Cool. OK, I guess then I'm an expert today. <laughs> Okay, so before we continue, um, I just want to tell you a few things about my talk. Uh, the goal of this talk is um, to explore some uh, different technologies. Uh, some are new, some are not that new anymore. Uh, and uh, I just want to put those technologies in, in a bit unexpected environment. So I'm completely aware that some of those things will not work on Mars, at least not in the way I will describe them, because there's a lot of other things that will just affect that. Um, and uh, this is not a deeply technical talk, because um, first, I need to, to give you a context. Why would anyone build anything for Mars? So that will take some time. And uh, the, I don't know, the, the topic of this, this conference is uh, problems for today uh, and ideas from the future. So uh, this talk will be a bit different. Uh, will solve problems for the, uh, from the future with ideas from today. OK, uh, let's start. Uh, first, I guess you have really important, uh, let's answer the most important question you have. And uh, not that one. Why Mars? Uh, why would anyone build anything for Mars? It's, let's see what do we know about Mars. Um, it's a planet. <laughs> That's a bit obvious. But, uh, so approximately, the Mars, ha uh, Mars have the same land mass as uh, Earth. It's quite smaller. It's uh, just 15% of uh, land mass of Earth. Um, but uh, since we have 70% of our planet covered by water, so land mass is almost the same. So that's nice. Uh, second great thing is that uh, day on Mars is almost the same as a day on Earth. Uh, so, for example, our plants will really love that. Uh, we don't need to create a completely different environment for the plants and all other things. So, again, that sounds great. Third thing is a year on Mars is twice longer than a year on Earth. And uh, that's, again, a, not a big problem. So, if you're Santa Claus, you, you just rest a bit more than, than on Earth. Uh, temperature on Mars, it can be 20 degrees. So. It's not nice as Barcelona, but it's not too hot, so that, that can work really well, too. And the gravity, that's important, too. So uh, on Mars, there's just 37% of Earth gravity. So, uh, what that means uh, is that we can jump much more, or I don't know. You don't need the elevator to come from second floor or something like that. You, ju you can just jump out the window, and everything will be OK. And there's also signs of liquid water on Mars. There's a lot of ice, we know that, but uh, there, there is some signs of liquid water, so that's great, too, because we need water for, for the living. And uh, that's not all. Uh, there's a lot of other cool things uh, for Mars. For example, the biggest mountain uh, in the solar system is on Mars, so uh, it's much, much bigger than uh, Mount Everest. And uh, they have two moons, so just imagine the sky in the night. That needs to be really great. But, of course, there's but. There are some problems with Mars. First one is that uh, just 18 of uh, 40 or even more missions on Mars were successful. Most of other failed. That's a problem, but uh, at some point, we'll probably solve that problem because our technology is better and better all the time. The second problem is that temperature can be minus 
153 degrees, and that's, that's not that nice. Uh, so just imagine something colder than Antarctic um, that looks like Sahara Desert or something like that. So definitely not the place where you would like to live. Yeah, but that's not the biggest problem. There's a big dust storms on Mars, and uh, it can last for a few months, and uh, it can cover almost the whole planet. That's not nice, too. <laughs> but again, that's not the biggest problem that we have on Mars. There's radiation, uh, because Mars uh, don't have uh, the atmosphere like we do, so there's much, much more radiation. And again, that's not the problem, because we don't have an atmosphere, so <laughs> that's the first thing. We're not able to breathe anything, so we'll probably not survive uh, long enough for radiation to kill us. So, why would anyone go to Mars? <laughs> Earth seems like a perfect place for a living, right? Uh, we have, I don't know, we have air. <laughs> That's great. Temperature is quite nice. Then, I don't know, there's uh, a lot of water and everything, so everything seems really perfect, and it is. But... Um, it's not that perfect if you ask dinosaurs. <laughs> so, <laughs> in Earth's history, there was a lot of mass extinction uh, events. Uh, there's five of the biggest one on that uh, chart. And in each of those events, we lost uh, more than 50% of all species. At the, one of them, the, uh, we lost uh, 19 to 96%, almost everything alive on the Earth. And that's not so great, right? So, we are software engineers. At some point, if we want to survive as human beings, we just need to make some kind of a backup copy or something like that in different data center. And uh, why, why Mars? Why not something else? Uh, first, let's go back to this, sorry. Uh, those events are not that often, so we are safe for next, probably next few thousand years or even more, but uh, if we don't start exploring those things right now, if we, wait, uh, we never know when the next one will happen and uh, how it will affect us. And what's our options? Uh, first option is uh, Venus. Oh, sorry, Mercury. Uh, it's not really a great place for a living because uh, it doesn't have an atmosphere at all. And uh, it's too close to the sun. So during the day, it's very, very hot, extremely hot. And during the night, it's very, very cold because there's no atmosphere that can uh, keep the temperature and everything. And again, there's Venus after that. Um, it's even worse. We have an atmosphere, but very thick one. And uh, we wouldn't survive pressure or temperature or anything else. There's actually a place in uh, Venus where it could be really nice for humans, but uh, it's 50 kilometers above the ground. And we're not that great with building uh, floating cities or something like that. So that's not an option. The next one is Mars, of course, with not so perfect options, but again, we can make it work somehow. And after that, uh, all other planets in our solar system are too far away, and they're gas giants, so we are not able to live on them. Okay, now, because we are talking about how to build a website on Mars, I want you to imagine that you have a website, some kind of website that will be useful to, to people. Any kind, we'll not get into the details because we don't have enough time. And let's just forget about that for, for now. Let's go back to Mars. So, at the moment, uh, Mars is the only planet inhabited by robots only. At least only that we know about. There can be some else planets, some other planets, of course, but we don't know about that. And uh, yeah, there's that crazy small creature that we don't know, maybe exist on Mars. Until one day in next 10, 15 years, that's not that far away, uh, some people start sending uh, other humans to Mars. Uh, that will be a slow process, but uh, they're planning to send first humans on Mars in, I don't know, next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, you're not able to send humans on Mars uh, anytime you want because you need to wait for planets to be aligned because uh, you don't want to travel uh, for a very long distance. And uh, the plan is that in, I don't know, next 100 years or even more, uh, Elon Musk have a plan to send uh, one million people to Mars. Why million? Because he, he thinks that that's enough population to build self-sustaining uh, self uh, 
I don't know, colony on Mars that doesn't depend on Earth. We'll see how that will work. But so, uh, in the beginning, people of course need some things. You probably know what it is. And when we get to Mars, we will first we need to find something uh, to, to build uh, some kind of colony where we can breed and uh, where we have some uh, food, water, and things like that. Then uh, we'll continue uh, building a society as on Earth, or probably a bit different, but we'll fulfill all those things that we really need. And after that, there will be something else that we really need. It's <laughs> Wi-Fi, yeah. So, at some point, we'll definitely have an internet on Mars. And how, will, uh, how, how that can work at all? Um, let's see. So imagine one day you have that website. Uh, you remember that uh, for a few minutes ago, uh, from a few minutes ago, sorry. And one day you receive some message like this, and you just ask, OK, can you tell me a browser and a bit more context about that? And then you receive something like this. And uh, so what's the problem? Why it's not working? So, uh, OK, uh, you start reading a lot of different things to, to find the problem. And uh, the first thing that you see is the distance between, between the planet. So uh, in perfect uh, alignment, uh, there's at least three minutes between. Uh, for um, Light need, uh, needs at least three minutes to travel from Earth to Mars. So if you're sending information at the same speed, round trip from Earth to Mars will be 6 to 44 minutes. That's not working with TCP IP protocol and anything else. The first thing that you can think about is just, uh, I don't know, deploying your website on some data center on Mars. And that will probably work, but in the beginning, AWS was just building their uh, data center, so. <laughs> We need to wait for them to, to finish it. OK, what else can we do? The, uh, we have large delay. It's not just a small latency or something like that. It's really huge latency, so no Netflix video or audio calls or anything like that. And I know he is not happy about that, but OK. So what can we do when we don't have enough servers? Maybe go serverless? <laughs> I actually really like serverless, but uh, it will not work <laughs> with this. So let's see how do we communicate on Mars. At, all. Uh, at the moment, we're using just radio waves. So uh, each spacecraft uh, sends radio waves, the same radio waves that you have, uh, that you are receiving in your car or something like that, uh, to Earth, and then NASA has the very big receivers that will uh, that just try to receive those things, uh, those waves, and uh, then it tries to respond with the same waves. And most of the time, they're really big because uh, we are building our spacecrafts to save the I don't know energy and everything. So, um, and they need to be really precise because they need to travel very far, and uh, they need to deliver some information. And then you need, of course, to parse that information and to to do something with it. There's interplanetary internet, too. Uh, this thing is not new at all. Uh, they're working on that for, I don't know, 20 years or more. Um, and how it works. So for example, on this GIF, you see how, uh, how much time light needs to travel from Earth to Moon. Just imagine how. Uh, so in perfect environment, we would have uh, interplanetary internet that will be fast as light. And let's just assume, it, assume that. But let's see how it works. There is delay and uh, disruption uh, tolerance networks. And they're a bit different than networks that we uh, know today. Networks that we know today work something like this. It just sends packages and wait for them to, to return. And if something just uh, stops working, uh, it will, uh, they will just retry. But uh, you need to do a, a full, uh, um, you need to send package from end to end. That's a bit problematic with Mars because we have uh, three to uh, 22 minutes and uh, you're not able to communicate if the sun is between the planets or if Mars rotates and the satellites are on the wrong side of the planet or something like that. So what we can do? Uh, this is a delay-tolerant network, and how it works, it's um, just uh, some kind of uh, 
store and forward uh, method. So it stores all the packages and it tries to forward them uh, to the next node. If something breaks, uh, you'll see it now, it will just try to resend it from the last, um, from the last node. Our nodes are, I don't know, satellites and uh, old satellites and any other device that we can use as a node. So uh, interplanetary internet is basically just the network of internets uh, with uh, the, that protocol in the between that can communicate a bit differently. But I don't, I don't know much about uh, networks, so let's go back to web development because we already know much more about that than the networks and everything. First thing that we can do on Mars is, of course, to go offline. When we first load our website, so uh, how, how do we load our website? I guess they will need to up, update something on some servers on Mars because we will have some servers, but uh, most uh, will not have big infrastructure, so we'll not be able to deploy everything to Mars, in the, at least not in the beginning. And uh, um, of course, NASA will use a lot of those things. NASA or whoever else will use a lot of uh, the resources to, to send more useful information than, I don't know, YouTube videos or something like that. So the first thing we can really do is just to make our website work, uh, to, to allow our website to work offline. And you already heard uh, before this talk about service workers, so I'll, I will not go that deep into the, the details, but service workers are just like some proxy between uh, browser, uh, your application, and network, so we can cache all the files, so we can, I don't know, intercept network requests and send uh, just the requests that really need to go to the server. Uh, if we have network, if we don't have network, we can get something from our local uh, cache or something like that. And uh, we can allow push notifications and we can do a background sync uh, and things like that. So I will not show much code today, but uh, some basic example of service worker will be something like this. So first you need to check uh, if browser has the support for service workers. You need to do that because some browsers unfortunately don't have support for that yet and we don't know when they will support it. And after that, you just need to re register files that you want to cache locally, and that's basically it. Uh, you can do much, much more with service workers. You saw that in the previous talk. Then, uh, you want to send, you don't want to send a lot of API uh, requests to the server because if anything goes to Earth, you need to wait a lot for that. If it's on Mars, again, you don't want to make, uh, I don't know, a, much pressure on that server because it's, I don't know, it's uh, all the other people are using the same server, so we don't have infrastructure again. So the thing you can use is GraphQL or something like that. We heard more about that uh, yesterday, but we can, uh, instead of sending API calls with the classic REST API and things like that, we can just use uh, GraphQL to uh, request everything that we really need for that view and uh, store that somewhere. Beside that, uh, we can, it's good to have some local copy of the data and everything. So for that, uh, we can use IndexedDB. Uh, it's not working perfectly in all browsers, of course, but it can be useful. At the moment that uh, when we move to Mars, it, it will probably be a bit better. Maybe so far we'll fix the bugs and everything. Uh, so what's, uh, what's an IndexedDB? It's just a low-level API for client-side uh, storage. Uh, and uh, there's a few concept that, uh, concepts that IndexedDB is using. First one, uh, it just stores key value pairs. Uh, it's a transactional database model, so everything you do is some kind of transaction. It's mostly asynchronous. Uh, then it, used, uh, it, uh, it uses DOM events to notify you when some thing are, uh, things are available, so you have some kind of success and error events and things like that. Uh, it's not using SQL, so it's basically a no SQL database. And uh, you need to be on the same origin to, to be able to use it. So that works nice. I will not show the code because the API for IndexedDB is not quite nice. But there's other things that you can use. Uh, for example, uh, there's PouchDB. That's basically just the in, uh, implementation of CouchDB in the browser. And uh, it syncs really well. 
and it works really well offline. So basically, you can uh, synchronize with the browser, uh, with some database, CouchDB, on the server, and get just the data that you want and store it on your browser. And when you make some changes and things like that, uh, whenever you're online, it will try to sync again with the with the real server and to send your information to the server. So uh, it's great for offline experience and things like that. Um, the, you can use uh, it with Node or with many other things. It works with uh, IndexedDB, with uh, WebSQL, with local storage and things like that. And uh, here's some basic examples. It's really simple to use. Uh, you just need to create a new uh, database to put some data into it and to connect to the, I don't know, other resource that you want to sync with. We are talking about background sync and uh, things like that. So, for example, when you try to send some uh, data to the server, what if server is not available at that moment for any reason? What can you do? Uh, basically, you can you can send the I don't know API uh, requests and things in the background. So, the you can just uh, if you don't have connection, browser can uh, some browsers uh, can, but uh, many others will uh, will can. Uh, will be able to do that in the future. But you can just basically save that uh, somewhere. Not in, uh, so even if you close the browser, system will try to send those requests when you have, uh, I don't know, an internet access ag again. So that works really nice. And for example, it will be great to do some kind of um, periodic uh, things or something like that. So for example, if you're reading your news at 10 in the morning, it can sync with the server at uh, I don't know, 7.30 or something like that. Beside that, uh, the other thing that we can do is just um, upload and do download big resources uh, with the uh, service workers. It's, it's not working right now, it's just a proposition, but uh, the idea is to enable background caching of multiple resources. So for, for example, you have some big files or something like that, and you just close the browser. Uh, it will continue to do that in the background because uh, operating system will uh, continue to downloading and uploading uh, everything, and it will just let you know when something is uh, ready for uh, for you to use or when something is uploaded. And uh, of course, it will uh, allow you to to react somehow on uh, if something fails to upload or download. Uh, you can read more about that on this link. And. Uh, that's it for service workers, but uh, that doesn't solve all of our problems. So, so if we don't have a server, how can we communicate at all? So there's peer-to-peer -peer connection with, uh, with WebRTC. We still need server in the beginning just to connect with other people on the same network. But after that, we'll send, uh, we can send files and everything just uh, by peer-to-peer -peer connection. WebRTC is a free open source pro uh, project that provides uh, that real-time communication for, uh, it provides simple API for real-time communication, and it works in the browsers. Um, there's a few APIs that it implements. First one is media stream. So for example, if you want to do voice calls or video calls or things like that, you can use that. Uh, there's RTC peer connection. That's uh, just for managing all the connections and things like that. And the third thing is uh, RTC data channel. So you can send the data, not just uh, uh, not just media, not just video or audio or something like that. Uh, and here's some example how to do that. Uh, WebRTC allowed us to, to build implementation of WebTorrent inside the browser. So what that means is that uh, you're basically able to load, your, uh, uh, to load and upload uh, torrents from your browser directly. And why, that, uh, why something like that is important for Mars? Uh, it's important because, for example, if I want to watch some movie, and some of you have that movie, I don't need to download the movie from Earth or from server or whatever. I can just stream it from uh, some other people in the same network. Uh, if it works for movies, it works the same for images or things like that. So it can solve our problem with media and with loading resources and things like that. So, as you can see on the website, uh, on their website, uh, just imagine peer-to-peer -peer YouTube. So you don't have servers, you just load everything from other people. That works great for us. Uh, and it's quite simple to, uh, to use it for some basic use cases. You just need to do something like that. You need magnet link, of course, but everything else is uh, quite simple. 
but um, if you can load images and um, I don't know videos and things like that via peer-to-peer -peer connection, why wouldn't you be able to load I don't know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? That seems like uh, it's just a file. So if you can load one type of file, you should be able to load some other types of file. So there's a thing called Hyperdrive, and uh, it's a file sharing network based on. Uh, it's basically something that allows you to, to make peer-to-peer -peer Dropbox really easily. So you can share files and you can, I don't know, load par uh, files from other peers. And as, as you can see, that is using that as a main protocol. That can allow us to build something really cool. We, we can build, for example, I don't know, uh, just imagine a distributed um, app store that doesn't have a server or something like that. So for example, if you have some application, I, I, I will be able to load that application from you via peer-to-peer -peer network. And we don't really need servers, so we can uh, ship whole applications or updates or things like that. We are just uh, simple peer-to-peer um, -peer connections. Of course, uh, we heard more about this a few days ago, but to, uh, instead of uh, I don't know, instead of uh, hyperdrive and things like that, we can use interplanetary file system. That will work too, uh, because they, they, uh, they can transfer a large amount of data from uh, one machine to another uh, via peer-to-peer -peer and other uh, protocols. Okay, but uh, those are the things that we can do from, uh, I don't know, with the technology that we have today, but that doesn't solve all of our problems. It just solves part of the problems. What, the, what are the other problems that we have? So for example, things like timestamps are a bit problematic. As you can remember, the day on Mars is a bit longer than day on Earth. It's 40 minutes longer, that's not much, but uh, again, it's, it's enough to cause some problems. So if you, uh, we probably need a better way to, to manage timestamps and things like that. Uh, beside that, how do we do login and things like that? So for example, you want to access Facebook. How do you do that from Mars? Because uh, you're not able to connect with Facebook all the time to check if uh, token and everything else is valid. So that's another problem. Then security and privacy. How, how do you, I don't know, how do you stay secure on Mars? Because uh, we don't have all the system that we have on Earth. And if a major, majority of our infrastructure is on Earth, how do we just check if, uh, I don't know, right person won the right file or something like that? that of course, in the beginning, we can just uh, assume that no one else will do that because we'll have a small population, but at some point that will be, I don't know, very uh, big problem probably. Uh, the, uh, the other problem is how, how do we test anything that we want to de uh, deploy to Mars? Because it's completely extreme situation, so how do you simulate that on Earth at all? So that's some of the problems that uh, we are not able to, to solve on front end. Uh, only we, we need to, I don't know, to use a backend, of course, and we need to find a better ways uh, to, I don't know, to handle those things. So what's the message of this uh, talk? It's a message that we now know how to build an Instagram for Mars or something like that. It's, no, it's not. It's, uh, it's not important uh, still because uh, we still have a lot of time until we send people to Mars and until we have problems like this. So. But uh, the main problem we have today is that um, most of the things that we are building today are not working for everyone on this planet. So most of the time we just don't care about, uh, we just assume a lot of things. And for example, if you live in, I don't know, Southeast Asia or, some, or Australia or something like that, you have a huge latency because majority of servers are in North America or Europe or something like that. And there's a lot of people with poor connections and uh, that are, uh, they're not able to, okay, we are building faster web applications and things like that, but uh, it's really hard to, to use all those things in some places without uh, stable internet and things like that. So for example, how do people on, I don't know, uh, South Pole or something like that check their emails because they don't have a uh, um, secure connection or uh, they have huge latency and things like that. And uh, we need to try to improve applications that we are building on Earth because um, at some point we'll need to build applications that we need to deploy to more other planets on, or who knows what, 
and uh, we're even not able right now to build applications that will work on this planet, on all parts of the planet without a problem. And basically, that's all from me. If you have any questions, you can ask them with that hashtag. Thank you, Slobodan. That was really cool. I really like the way you ended there because I was talking recently to some people who um, travel around African villages vaccinating yep. children and they're offline for days and days and they're using pouch TB and service workers. Yes. So it's, it's a real problem as well as uh, a, fun, a fun trip to Mars. Uh, actually, they tested, inter uh, sorry, they tested in interplanetary internet on some villages far north or, and things like that because they don't have stable connection and you have big latencies. And, uh, yeah. Excellent. A few questions from the audience. Is there a limit to the amount of stuff <clears throat> that you can store in the service worker cache, do you know? Yeah, uh, there's a limit, and uh, it depends uh, from a browser to browser. Uh, but uh, that thing will evolve, so we'll probably be able to store more things. Or... And presumably it depends upon the memory available on the device Of course, well. but you can ask for more uh, memory and things like that. So for now, that's not a big concern. Excellent. And uh, the same question I put to Andrew, because you mentioned Safari a couple of times. Is Safari the new IE6? I don't know. It's just Safari. <laughs> Who okay, knows? Thank you. We'll see. It will introduce probably. Uh, actually, it, we already have some issues with Safari. It's, uh, it works differently than other browsers, but we'll see how it will evolve. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Slobodan, please. Bye.